Hello, I'm Jackie Seneshaw, and on behalf of the Historical Society of Harford County, I welcome you to this episode of our monthly speaker series, Aberdeen Proving Grounds Historical Role in Computer Development. Before we get started, please take a moment to hit the subscribe button so you can receive notifications of future episodes in our speaker series. Computers have become an integral part of our everyday 21st century lives. They run our businesses, cars, appliances, and machinery. We use them to communicate in numerous ways, from recorded videos like this one, to those little phones we carry around all the time to make calls and receive emails, play music, play games, and generally function in today's world. These indispensable machines and their operation are actually less than a century old. They've been developed within the, within the lifetime of some of you listening to this episode. Yet most of us are unaware of the pivotal role that Aberdeen Proving Ground here in Harford County has played in the development of this marvelous technology. Our speaker today, Charlie Niewitz, is going to tell us that story. Charlie retired in October of 2010 from the Army Research Laboratory. After 39 years as an experimental and computational researcher and manager, he received his BS and master's degrees in mechanical engineering from the University of Dayton. He's worked in computers as part of the Army's Ballistic Research Laboratory at Aberdeen Proving Ground as a, both a military and civilian and also at the Army Research Laboratory. Charlie, please tell us the story. Will do. Thank you, Jackie. I uh, appreciate the invite. I uh, appreciate the uh, Hartford uh, Historical Society's uh, putting these uh, things together so that we uh, have them. Uh, more importantly, so our kids have them, uh, some of these stories. Uh, I need to thank the Army Research Lab as well, uh, least of which is all the years I've been able to work there and uh, fortunate to work there. And in particular, the staff at the Superimpeding Center who helped provide me with uh, a lot of the information you're going to see. So what I'd like to do is to sort of take you on a little tour, uh, starting back in around 1946, a little bit before that. And you're looking at the ENIAC computer, which was developed in that time frame. And we're bringing you up to date in terms of the Army Research Lab Supercomputing Center, which still exists to this day out at Aberdeen uh, Proving Ground. The second part of the talk will be to uh, tell you a little bit about the Discovery Center at Water's Edge. Uh, which we're opening in uh, 2023, and then maybe the full uh, vision, which you see on the right-hand side. So that's sort of the outline of where we're going to go uh, here today. Well, it all started uh, back with a need, right? And many things start with a need. Uh, so the Department of Defense, uh, back in World War II, needed to calculate artillery um, uh, trajectories. On the right-hand side, you see a number of different trajectories, you know, you, you fire and it lands short, you fire and it lands far. Well, those trajectories, you need to calculate the azimuth, the elevation, the pointing of, of the gun. So World War II, artillery, trajectories, all critical in terms of the need. Calculations were the stumbling block because it took so long. Every uh, gun tube in the... Um, United States Army has associated with it a firing table that you see here, kind of a brown book. Uh, it's all computerized now, but these were the firing tables. Um, so uh, the, the next slide talks about, uh, similarly, that, that the, the firing table provides the aiming data. That's the point. In other words, artillery uh, weapons go out and they need to know how to set up the weapon in order to hit a target uh, uh, many miles away. Uh, these firing tables needed to be computed, and one trajectory took 15 minutes using what's called a differential analyzer. It actually took 20 hours using a calculator, uh, a um, uh, Merchant uh, calculator, but it required hundreds of trajectories. And with a whole series of, of folks working on this, they could still only produce 15 per week, while the need was up around 400. 
Well, in comes sort of the Ballistic Research Laboratory. It was established at the Proving Ground in 1938. And in 1992, it then became and formed the Army Research Lab. So the essence of the Ballistic Research Lab is still there inside of the Army Research Lab today. Um, it started back in 1917 as the Ballistics Branch. Uh, in 1938, it was reorganized into Exterior, Interior, Ballistics, Ballistics Measurements, Ordnance, and Computing. In war reserve. When I came to uh, in the service in 1971, I was assigned to the Exterior Ballistics Lab, and I'll mention a little bit later on about uh, some efforts there. And we are out about 700 people. It was responsible for computing the trajectories, doing the the uh, determining equations, as well as computing the trajectories for the ballistic firing state. Well, fortunately, back in 19. 40, the Ballistics Research Lab had a very prestigious scientific advisory board. And they're seen here, uh, sitting in front of a building 328, which is on APG, and that building was still in construction back there in, in, in 1940. Uh, the main objective was to review and plan different Army science and research. It was made up of the premier scientists and mathematicians of the World War II area. Most notably, two of those sitting there in the front row are Dr. Theodore von Karman and Dr. John von Neumann. And uh, von Karman was responsible for initiating the wind tunnel program, and von Neumann was responsible for working with the uh, ENIAC. And I'm going to tell you an interesting story about how that came about. So here's a little bit about John von Neumann. He... Um, Again, a, a very well-known uh, pioneer uh, in a number of different areas. Um, the computers to this day are still based on the von Neumann architecture. He was advisor to the Atomic Energy Commission. He served on a Manhattan project. As I mentioned, part of the scientific advisory team. He won the Presidential Medal, the Medal of Freedom, and the Fermi Award in, in 56. A very notable um, scientist. So the firing table production during World War II, um, like I said, required hundreds of, of, of calculations. I mentioned uh, a 60 second trajectory took 20 hours using this over here on the right. The top picture is a Mershant calculator. So there were typically many women, and it was and it was generally all women in a room with these calculators doing calculation after calculation after calculation. BRL hired 100 of the female graduate students as human computers. In fact, that was their name. They were the computer. Not today that we have the machines. The, the, the women who did this work were named computer. So, like I said, it took... Um, uh, they needed to compute many, many firing tables. Didn't have enough time. So the Army Secret Project, Project PX, begins. And that project is a collaboration between John Mockley and John Presbert Eckert, both at the University of Pennsylvania, Moore School of Engineering, where they submitted a proposal to the BRL highlighting what they may be able to build in terms of a high-speed computation device. They didn't even call it a computer at that time. It was just high-speed computation device. The bottom left, you'll see a picture of the Moore School of Engineering, and I have a story to tell about that later. Um, here's a road marker that's there uh, uh, up in, in um, Pennsylvania talking about uh, who invented it. And here's a plaque at the University of Pennsylvania. The road marker, we have one here on Route 22. As you go into the, uh, the gate on Route 22, you look on the right-hand side, um, and you'll see an ENIAC plaque basically stating that the ENIAC was uh, placed here at the Ballistic Research Lab. So in 1943, a contract was signed with BRL to construct this electronic numerical integrator computer. Now, this was a major, major commitment for something that no one knew would work. They had no clue whether this was going to work. 
but they uh, they came and gave a presentation in a ballistic research lab with again with the scientific advisors uh, gave it the green light. The cost was on the order of a million dollars in 2023 dollars, and then in 1944 they needed increased capability. They added more uh, to the configuration and it brought the the price tag up to eight million dollars. Now again, I got to set the stage in terms of somebody coming and saying, "Hey, you know, give me eight million dollars, and I'm going to give you something that I think is going to work." Uh, it shows how um, uh, well, I'm smart. I don't know what the right word is, but it, but it shows you um, how the science community looked at this and and said it's something well worth uh, trying. And as we know today, it surely was well worth trying. So here's some pictures of the ENIAC. Uh, top left, you'll see uh, Herman Goldstein, um, second from the right, and you'll see um, uh, John von Neumann uh, on the right-hand side. No, Herman Goldstein is the second from the left, and um, John von Neumann is pictured on the right. In the main room, and I'll tell you later how, how big that, well, it, it was an 1800 uh, square foot room. Uh, the, all the pieces of the computer weighed about 30 tons. And um, you have John McCauley here, Prosper Eckert over here. You'll notice some women over here. And these weren't staged women to get pictures. These were the women who were the first programmers of the ENIAC. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Down at the bottom, here's two more, Ruth uh, Gordon and Esther uh, Gersten. And you can see they're programming ENIAC. The ENIAC was programmed by uh, uh, flipping switches, plugging in cables, and making sure everything was in proper order. Well, here's sort of an interesting story. I talked about John von Neumann, and I mentioned Herman Goldstein. Well, Herman Goldstein was a lieutenant in the US Army, and he was the program manager of the ENIAC. So he was a PhD mathematician. John von Neumann, the Hungarian mathematician, and uh, this story was told to me directly by Herman Goldstein in 1996, when he was here, where we celebrated the 50 year anniversary of the ENIAC. And Herman told me, he, he says, I, I, it was hard to believe, but I was on the platform getting ready to go up to uh, the University of Pennsylvania. And I looked to my left and there was von Neumann. And, he was surprised because, again, the scientist with that reputation to be standing there. So he went over and he talked to John von Neumann, told him who he was, told him who, uh, you know, what, or told him who he was, and told him that he's working on this secret project that um, von Neumann would be most likely interested in. Von Neumann told Goldstein that he was working on a secret project that Goldstein might be interested in. I'm assuming, he didn't say it, I'm assuming, not there in public, but off the tracks, they started talking about what was going on. Um, and that began the collaboration between Herman Goldstein, John von Neumann, right here on the platform in Aberdeen Proving Ground. Uh, I just think that's a fantastic story uh, that needs to be um, recorded and written and whatever, however we want to keep it. It's interesting. Excuse me. Yes. It's interesting just to see how those kinds of chance meetings can have wow. such powerful, powerful effects. And, and when you see where, where that's led to, I mean, obviously no one knew it was going to lead to where it is today, but that was the beginning. Exactly. Um, it, again, when it when it got unveiled and the project was no longer secret, uh, President Truman came down and, and took a look at it. Uh, pieces of it to the right are the function tables. There were 30 of those function tables. There's something called a decade counter, which is shown on the right. Now, that piece right there with the tubes in it, that decade counter is still on display inside of the Army Research Lab. You'll notice also on the left-hand side, vacuum tubes. So these were all spares, but these are other vacuum tubes that were inserted into the computer. And you needed the spares because the computer, the ENIAC, had over 17,000 vacuum tubes in it. And the mean time between failure on a vacuum tube wasn't very long. So there were people there routinely replacing vacuum tubes. 
70,000 resistors, 10,000 capacitors, 1,500 relays. But here's the important thing, 6,000 manual switches, 6,000 different switches that in some cases had to be programmed to get the machine working the way it was supposed to work. I said before, it covered 1,800 square feet and weighed, thir weighed 30 tons and then consumed about 160 kilowatts of electrical power. But the important part is it could calculate that 60 second trajectory in 30 seconds. A huge, huge gain over the 15 minutes on the differential analyzer. So this was a major accomplishment. But I also can't emphasize enough the role that the women played in this story. And I'll get to that uh, uh, in, in, well, I'll get to that right now. <laughs> um, there's a book which I would encourage you to get. It's called The Proving Ground. It's the untold story of the six women who programmed the world's first modern computer, the ENIAC. It was put together and written by Kathy Kleiman, who has spent many years gathering information, talking to the to, to the women uh, who at the time were alive and recorded their stories. And if you just search on the web for the women of the ENIAC, Kathy Kleiman, you'll see some tremendous uh, interviews that she had with, 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 these, with these women. Um, we had Kathy here uh, November 30th of last year to um, have a book signing. We had about uh, 100 people or so who were there uh, together with the uh, the students, some of the students of uh, Havana Grace High School. But here's two important things that, that, that I'll pull out on the book, The Proving Ground. I didn't know this, but I mentioned the Moore School of Engineering. That's where the ENIAC was built. The Moore's building was a, a philanthropist, uh, Moore, provided money to build a building. But in that arrangement or in that will or however it turned out he made a he he said that there will be no women allowed inside that building now that's a bit ironic since the men who built this thing didn't know how to program it. the only people who knew how to program it were the women so they forgot about what Moore said the women went into the the to the building and helped um, uh, develop the program. Uh, but unfortunately, back in those days, and uh, the women were not given the credit for the work that they had done. They had a big uh, uh, opening celebration. They showed the calculations of the, they showed the, the ENIAC doing the calculations. The women weren't even invited to that event. And this is what you'll learn inside of the Proving Ground. So uh, again, the important point here is that uh, the women had a significant role um, with building the, the, the uh, uh, computer age back then, and, and many to this day are, are, are uh, continuing on that path. So the Army um, didn't just stop there. The Army said, the ENIAC is pretty good. We need bigger, faster machines. So there's a series of machines that were built uh, this one here is the EDVAC, uh, Electronic Discrete Variable Computer. Again, with John Neumann's, von Neumann's hand in it, he worked on the ENIAC and the, and the EDVAC. This machine was in the order of uh, $2 million, close to $2 million and $21. Um, and it was installed in VRL in 1949. After the EDVAC was the ORDVAC, Ordnance Discrete Variable Automatic Computer, Together with the ENIAC, EDVAC, ORDVAC, BRL in that time frame, 1952, was the world's most powerful computer center. Right here in Aberdeen Proving Ground in Hartford County. These are the facts that many people don't know. And again, through things like this, we're hoping to make that um, uh, well known. Um, the ORDVAC was again based on the John von Neumann architecture. It was the first computer to have what's called a compiler. All computers today have a, have a compiler. Um, and it passed acceptance test in uh, 1952. After that, 1964, 1967, there was a machine called Burlesque One. But before you get too concerned about the acronym, 
It stands for the Ballistic Research Laboratory Electronic Scientific Computer Number One. It also had vacuum tubes, but now it had some transistors. Um, the input was uh, uh, punch cards and, and magnetic tape. And it could do 5 million calculations per second. Now, later on, I'll talk about what this flops, the floating point operations per second. And the cost was on the order of $2 million. Here we are, 1967 to 1978. The Ballistic Research Laboratory Electron Electronic Scientific Computer Number 2 was built. And this is the machine that I ran on when I came here in 1971. It came operational in 67. Um, significantly faster than the Orvac. Again, input was a magnetic tape and punched cards. Uh, I was a wind tunnel program engineer. I would run the wind tunnel test. Uh, the data would come out on these magnetic tapes. So I'd take the magnetic tapes over to building 328 to the computer room where they would be processed uh, using a Fortran code and generate the, the, the uh, aerodynamic input for the firing tables. So that was the end of the Ballistic Research Lab building computers, but it was not the end of the Ballistic Research Lab and now the Army Research Lab housing computers and using supercomputers as a everyday tool in doing their job. So I mentioned the word supercomputer. Well, what is that? Well, a supercomputer Think of it as the computer that performs at or near the highest operational rate for computers of the day. So the ENIAC was a supercomputer in 1946. It just didn't have that term. The EDVAC, the ORVAC, Burlesque 1, Burlesque 2. So they measure the speed by something called the floating point operations per second. So a mathematical operation, an addition, a subtraction, a multiplication, a division is an operation, is that one operation. So if a machine was capable of doing a megaflop, that would be 1 million calculations per second. Well, today the machines are doing on the order of exaflops. Well, a petaflop, which is more typical out there today, that's a million billion calculations per second. It, to me, it's a mind boggling number. It, it, it's kind of like, I don't know, watching a national debt or something. You know, it just go, it's a number that, you can't wrap your hands around. But it's the kind of numbers that you have to have if you want to do the research of today. In the research of today, whether it be uh, COVID, uh, new Department of Defense systems, uh, data mining, artificial intelligence, any of those things require the use and application of supercomputers. So again, started in 45, goes to this day, and, and will continue. Now, here's sort of an evolution of supercomputers, just trying to relate it to the ENIAC. Now, I programmed on the Cray-2 in 1985. That machine was on the order of $30 million, and it had four big, what's called central processing units. Today, machines are made up of cores. Think of a core. Think of the machine that you have at home. Inside of it, it has maybe one core, maybe two cores, maybe four cores at the most. Well, in 2020, this machine had 9,000 9, cores and 27,000 what's called graphical processing units. The point is the machines today are made up of massive amounts of cores running in parallel. Some of the fastest supercomputers today have on the order of 700,000 cores all running in parallel to solve a problem and to give you the kind of uh, floating point operations per second uh, that I had mentioned uh, uh, previously. Um, the weight, uh, here if you look at the ENIAC, was 25 tons, 30 tons. The Cray-2 was only two and a half tons. But as the machines got bigger and take up warehouse size buildings, um, the weight is now, you know, 340 tons, 5,000. Uh, square feet uh, on, on some of the um, uh, supercomputers of today. But here's another important thing. Look down there at the useful life. The useful life of these machines are on the order of five to eight years, which means we're putting 
anywhere from 10 to $30 million into a machine with a useful life of five to eight years. But the point is, we sort of can't live without that. I mean, um, our competitors in foreign countries uh, are, are using these systems and, and we need them as well. So here's just some pictures of a, so again, here's the ENIAC, you saw some pictures. Here's what a Cray 2 looks like. And I programmed on this particular machine. Here's what um, a, a Summit and Sierra, two Department of Energy uh, supercomputers look like. So you can see there's rack and rack and rack of, of uh, computers, um, all taking up a um, uh, huge amount of space. This shows the increase in, just think of this line as increase in speed. So I mentioned petaflops. So the, the summit at the Oak Ridge National Lab, Department of Energy uh, is, is um, uh, and this goes, this is only in 2019. So it, this, this line continues going uh, to this day. Now, I can't talk about this without bringing up a colleague of mine a very brilliant computer scientist, Mike Moose. Mike Moose, I got to know Mike. Uh, I came here in 71. He came after um, uh, in, in the mid to late 70s, but a brilliant, brilliant computer scientist. Uh, he was at John Hopkins University. He worked at the Ballistic Research Lab, now the Army Research Lab. He created something called BRL CAD, Computer Aided Design. Doesn't sound like much today, but back in the late 70s, Nobody had that. He developed that. He was also, uh, call him the first cyber detective. He testified in the Morris Worm incident, which is an, was an attack on the um, uh, network, uh, the Department of Defense network, and he testified in that. <laughs> he was in the cuckoo's nest, and he developed this technical foundation for the internet. He's most famous for inventing something called PING, P-I-N-G. It's not an ac ac it's not an um, acronym. Ping. It's it's used worldwide to test the reachability of computers. If I want to know a computer is alive and well over in California, I know the IP address. I would ping that IP address. If I get responses back, it tells me that machine is up and live. That was developed by Mike. Now we spoke about this earlier. And you explained to me what happened. What what caused Mike to develop that? Ping functionality. Well, he 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 knew he knew that these networks would um, uh, you, you can send information on the networks. And now this one is as the story goes. So um, we're told that he was in a, he was in a, a, a building it was about a thousand feet away from another building. Um, it was a cold, windy night, and he had been thinking about this before. It's not like he came up with that night, and he had developed some of this code. And so he had put this paint together and tried it from one of the buildings in BRL to another building in BRL and found out that indeed he could determine um, that the machine in another building inside of the compound was alive and well without having to go out in that nasty weather. So it was all about just keeping out of the rain. I guess. But like I said, had he not been doing the research before that, um, he might have had to go out in, into the rain. But that's the kind of uh, person Mike was. Very unfortunate um, uh, uh, occurred in in in, in uh, November uh, twenty two thousand. Mike worked strange hours, right? He would we'd be there during the day. He'd be there all night, or he'd be there um, uh, you know half the day and then two days in a row. Just strange hours. So actually, he he uh, went to to grab dinner. At uh, there's a restaurant on um, Route 22 and 95, the Golden Corral, I think it might have been back then. And uh, he had dinner. He lived in Havre Grace. He went down the ramp on Aberdeen on his short drive over to uh, um, Havre Grace. Uh, a, a truck tractor trailer either back uh, 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 turned over. Don't know the details on that. But Mike was involved in a horrific accident and died there in between Aberdeen and um, Havana Grace. Tremendous loss, tremendous loss. Um, and to me, 
the stories that I'm relating of my time there and who I knew and uh, would not be complete without uh, uh, without mentioning Mike. And Mike would be the guy I would call up. I'd, my code would be running one day and I'd come in the next day and the same code didn't work. Ah, damn, I, I know it's Mike. Hey, Mike, did you do something last night to those machines? Yeah, Charlie, I tried to... Uh, uh, fix something and uh, why isn't it not? No, it's not working, Mike. Okay, I'll set it. I'll fix it in the next 10 minutes. It's fixed. So we would have those kinds of conversations. Again, just a great guy. Surely, surely uh, missed. So we are today at the Ballistic Research, at the Army Research Lab, housing the uh, DOD Supercomputing Resource Center. There's only four of those in the country. Uh, two in Mississippi, one in um, um, out in o Ohio, in uh, Dayton, Ohio, at the um, uh, Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, and one here at APG um, in the Army Research Lab. I became the first director in 1996 and was a director of this center until I retired in 2010. Um, so this center, now here's the, the, the building that houses these. What's ironic is this building were the wind tunnel buildings when I came in 1971. Those wind tunnels were all replaced by computers. So what was done experimentally to determine the aerodynamics is now done computationally. Some of the machines here, Excalibur, uh, Centennial, Hellfire, these are the different machines that are there. You'll notice I mentioned the number of cores. So here, Excalibur, 101,000 cores running in it um, to get the kind of speeds that, that we had talked about. Um, it provides computing power to all of the Department of Defense and of value to the economy, to the area, to the Army Research Lab. The DOD investment, going back even before the center was open, started in 1993, to when this chart was put together, and I think it was 2020, BRL, ARL received $985 million in terms of either computers or uh, uh, contractors paying for contractors to run the center. Anyway, it's a huge, big operation. It's still going on to this, to this day. I had mentioned the, the women uh, programmers. Well, one neat thing is that is the new machines that are coming online are now going to be named after the original six ENIAC programmers. So here's one of those machines. It's a Cray machine, 102,000 compute nodes, and it's named after Betty. There's a picture of Betty there looking at some of her notes when she was working on the ENIAC. And this is the, the picture on the left is the length of that, that machine. That's what houses the 102,000 cores. So a very nice tribute, I think, to the women of the, uh, the, the the programmers who didn't get their just due back in 45, but now are, are uh, getting it. Well, what do supercomputers do? Well, here's just an example of some things. So on the right-hand side, here's a projectile going down a simulated range. This is a projectile flying through a supercomputer where we can determine the aerodynamics of it. And if it's not right, we can redesign it computationally, send it down there again. Take a look at the left side, where it says rapid design and fielding of tactical truck armor. The supercomputers are used in the design development of armor to protect our soldiers. And the armor that was worked on by our folks here at the Army Research Lab and programmed on the supercomputers was put in place in Iraq within four months. And look at the note it says here. It says, this truck saved my life as well as five others on 2 April 2008 in Basra. Um, I'm not sure what the 12 stands for. So the important point here is these machines are used for basic and applied scientific research. And the work that's being done on a proving ground, not only here, but throughout the program round, is done for the purpose of keeping our troops safe, saving lives, and deterring the forces who uh, want to come against us. 
So that sort of is the story of the um, supercomputers from beginning to where we are today. I'd like to briefly just mention something called the Discovery Center at Water's Edge. The byline is where science, technology, and heritage meet. The science part is a, think of it as a STEM-based, hands-on science center for kids to get excited about science. We need more scientists, engineers, and science is not, nece science is not necessarily easy, but let's get the kids excited about it early on. The technology piece is at the center, we like to say, we're gonna show you tomorrow's technology today because that's what's being worked on the proving ground. One example of that most recently is we hope to have a display which shows the helmet work that's being done at the Army Research Lab in conjunction with the National Football League um, and MIT to, to provide a helmet that is um, better for the soldiers and also protects the football players from, uh, from uh, concussions. And then the last piece fits with what we're talking about. It's the heritage. Proving Ground's been there for 100, over 100 years. There are things that have happened there that affect our lives every day. Just like the computer that I talked about, right? It, it, everything we do is based on, on, on the computer technology. Well, high-speed photographer, photography, stopping a projectile that's flying three times the speed of sound and looking at the shock waves that are formed on that was developed here at the Proving Ground. We're not quite sure of this one yet, but we're researching it. We believe that the dogs that sniff out COVID, that sniff out cocaine, that sniff out drugs, started here at Aberdeen Proving Ground in 1917, sniffing out mustard gas. So again, this historical piece of what has happened here at the Proving Ground and what continues to happen is what we wanna bring out into the Discovery Center. This is a conceptual picture of what our phase three might look like. Um, I mentioned a number of the things here on the left-hand side that, that we had hoped to, uh, uh, to, to develop with, the, with this. We're very fortunate to partner with Jim Falk over at uh, Water's Edge. This is his facilities out here, over here on the right-hand side, the buildings. Uh, you'll, you'll see signs for uh, service engineering uh, and other uh, uh, DOD organizations. Well, we worked with him on where this circle is, um, where we're building a preview center, not the three-story building you saw, but the preview center. Jim's vision is in between the preview center and his complex is to build a little park, which has uh, docks going out so you can launch a kayak, has pickleball courts. We hope to be able to have experiments out on the Bush River. And the timeline is something like this. 2023, we're going to open the preview center. 2025, the rest of the building will get and have about 10,000 square feet. And 2028, we hope to start construction on a 35,000 square foot facility. Well, here's what the building looks like now. If you've been down the road on, on Route 40 in between Habit, uh, Aberdeen and Habit of Grace, you're going to see this used to be a red building. Now you're going to see a blue building. It's totally refurbished. We were fortunate to get a $700,000 grant from the uh, state of uh, from, from Maryland to refurbish the building both outside and inside. Here's a desk uh, that we got from Jim Falk as the entrance lobby. Here's some equipment on the right-hand side that's coming in. Look at the view out here. This is the view out the back door of the Discovery Center of the Bush River. Gorgeous, gorgeous view out there. And this is, if you were looking through the doors, these doors are at the back of this building and it looks out over onto the Bush River. Here's an example of the kinds of things conceptually that we're gonna have there. Uh, these are vertical wind tunnels where the, the kids can put balls, different weights in there and, and, and find out that, geez, a heavier ball uh, you know, is further down, a lighter ball is further up based on the wind velocity of the tube. Uh, we're gonna. There's a. We're we're gonna get a um, a drone uh, from Jeff Falk to hang up there. This is in place right now. This is called the topographic box. It's sand where the kids can build mountains and 
and then they put their hand over top of the of the display that's of the projector and all of a sudden the it begins to turn blue you're you're causing synthetic rain to fall down on this topographical area and the kids can see then how the mountains make the water you know go into the rivers based on the construction or based on the 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 top the topography of the uh of, of the sand we're, we're excited about having that that's there and it's up and operational and we have a, a corner there called the chesapeake bay watershed quarter corner um we're having this year the magic of science fair and family festival it's at the toon center on thomas run road in bel air it's june 10th 2023 there's two pieces magic of science fair for the sixth seventh and eighth graders and they will, can put in um, projects, which will be judged by people from the proving ground mostly, scientists and engineers. And the prizes they win are the technical equivalent of about $400, 3D printers, virtual reality handset, uh, headsets. The fair, I'm sorry, the, I should have said the, the fair over on the right-hand side is from eight to three. So the kids come in, they set up their posters, they judge it, and it's over three. But the festival goes from 11 to 4. We're going to have over 40 different tables with um, scientific displays. Kids can play with different things. Kids, adults, people, whoever ever come. We ran the first one in uh, 2022. We were worried. We had no clue how many people were going to show up. 10, 50, 100. Man, if 200 people come, we're golden. The day ended. We had 2,000 people show up for the Magic of Science Fair and Family Festival in 2022. It tells me a couple of things. One, it tells me there's a thirst for science-based activities within the county. So um, if, have your yourself, your kids go to this website. They'll find out information about the fair, about the uh, festival, and about the Discovery Center. So to end, I... Hopefully brought you through a little history of the ENIAC to the computers of today, and then extended that history in terms of what we'd like to do with the Discovery Center at Water's Edge. Um, and with that, uh, Jackie, I'll turn it back over to you. I do have one question for you. Is the Discovery Center open on a daily basis, or is it only open for special events? Well, right now, we don't have the certificate, the certificate of occupancy yet. <laughs> We're shooting and get that in early May. We're going to have a series of soft openings, you know, just trying some things out. And then we'll most likely be open Saturday, Sunday, and one day during the week. As we, again, it's a preview center, so it's not the full-fledged thing, but we have a classroom in there. So we hope to teach classes. And so I, I guess think of this as an evolutionary thing. The other thing is, as you come in, since it's a preview center, we're looking for, hey, what would you like to see in the Discovery Center? What's of importance to you as a family, as to a parent, uh, in terms of getting your kids interested in science? So you can help us. It, it, it's much different than going to an established center like a science center in Baltimore. You know, they've been running for many, many years. They have a lot of things going on. Think of this as, as something you want to have built here in Hartford County, and what would you like to see? Very, very good. Uh, for those of you who are listening who want to learn more about the history of computers, um, Charlie's been kind enough to provide us with resources. He talked about the book, Proving Ground, the Untold Stories of the Six Women Who Programmed the First Modern Computer. That's available through Amazon um, and at the local libraries. Um, 50 Years of Army Computing from ENIAC to MSRRC um, is available. Again, there's a link here to the actual PDF where you can purchase it on Amazon. Um, there is an oral history of computing, an interview with Harold Bro uh, that was done about 10 years ago. Uh, that's available in the Digital Maryland Collection. Um, and then there is a history of computing information that was computed, compiled by Mark Muse, Mike Muse, whom uh, Charlie referred to, and that is available publicly um, 
<clears throat> through the link that's there on your screen. Um, I want to say thank you to all of you for visit, joining us today uh, and giving us your time. We very much appreciate it. Be sure to like this video, uh, tell your friends about it, uh, subscribe to our channel if you haven't done so already so you can receive notifications of future events. Um, at the Historical Society of Hartford County, we do have a number of bulletins um, that chronicle some of the history of Aberdeen Proving Ground. Uh, the first one was number 27. That's pretty early in, in our collection. Uh, APG, Perryman, and Edgewood. Uh, number 49 talks about the Ordnance School buildings, and I apologize, I misspelled that, the Ordnance School buildings at Aberdeen Proving Ground. Number 54 uh, is about Aberdeen itself and talks about its role in transportation and technology. And then number 109 talks about Harford County and World War I, uh, the military heritage. And so it talks about the foundations and the founding of Aberdeen Proving Ground. <clears throat> we have another number of upcoming events um, in May of 2023. On May 6th, uh, we'll have a presentation at Jerusalem Mill about the mill that built a village to learn a little bit about how uh, that colonial village came to be. Uh, and the 10th is our monthly genealogical workshop at the Historical Society in the evening. And on May 20th, we're very excited to announce uh, that we will have uh, a grand opening or a reopening of the Historical Society's building, which has been closed to the public for quite some time as we've done a bunch of construction uh, and the launch of the Historical Society's Museum of Hartford County. That event will be from two to six that evening at the historical, that afternoon at the Historical Society. That's on May 20th. Thank you so much for giving us your time today. We hope you've enjoyed this as much as we've enjoyed talking about it. Take care.